Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's session. My name is Arlene Padron, and I'll be your host and moderator. With me today from the University of Alberta, Faculty of Pharmacy and Pharmaceutical Sciences is Daniela Silva, Dr. Raymar Lobenberg, and co-author on the publication for which this webinar is based is Dr. Bob Clark, Senior Research Fellow at Simulations Plus. A few housekeeping notes. For optimal video and audio connection, we recommend you close out any additional web or streaming applications that may affect your internet bandwidth. We take your privacy rights seriously, and by attending this event or participating in the Q&A session, you're allowing us to contact you for follow-up. This webinar is being recorded for future playback on our website and YouTube channel. You may ask questions at any time via the questions panel on your dashboard. And if you're having technical difficulties, please use the hand raising icon and we can assist you. Now, for those of you just joining us, welcome to today's webinar, Phytocannabinoid Drug-Drug Interactions and Their Clinical Implications. You are in the right place to enjoy a thought-provoking and engaging presentation. So for our audience members, we do have a quick poll question that I'm going to go ahead and launch. And if you could just describe yourself in a moment. We'll give you a few seconds to answer. Wonderful. So this gives us a good indication of who we have joining us today. So thank you for your answer. And now I'd like to turn it over to my colleague, Cheryl Ann Ayagata, to talk more about the Simulations Plus Academic and Reference Site Program. Cheryl Ann, take it away. Thank you, Arlene. Um, Simulations Plus partners with numerous academic institutions around the world to advance the use of modeling and simulation sciences. This partnership is known as a reference site and is then governed by a nonprofit agreement. A free license is granted with the expectation that the academic institution will publish citing the software or provide other tangible mentions that will advance the Simulations Plus platform. The new reference site agreement helps clarify the expectations for all such licenses, and we wanted to share this with you now. Once an initial license is established, the institution may qualify for future free licenses and extensions. To do so, a site must agree and then meet any combination of the following criteria for a subsequent year renewal or extension of the existing license. A free one-year renewal would require a publication, a poster, or present in a webinar similar to that which we are doing today. For a three-month extension, activities like a quote or testimonial that may be used on the Simulations Plus website or on social media like Facebook, Twitter, or LinkedIn is all it takes. Additional qualification may be agreed to in advance please do let us know if there are any questions or if your academic institution would like to learn more about this program. Introducing today, uh, presenting today, Dr. Lobenberg. Dr. Lobenberg holds a BS in pharmacy for the Johannes Gutenberg University in Mainz. Germany. He received his PhD in pharmaceutics. And I'm not going to read this entire screen to you. My apologies in the interest of time. You'd much rather listen to him. Uh, but in short, he joined the University of Alberta in 2000. His research interests are in biopharmaceutics to present, predict the oral performance of drugs and botanicals and inhaled nanoparticles to treat lung diseases like lung, lung cancer and tuberculosis. 
He is the founder and director of the Drug Development and Innovation Center at the University of Alberta. He is a member of the Health Canada Scientific Advisory Committee on Opiate Abuse. Also presenting today is Daniela Amara Silva, a PhD candidate. Daniela obtained her BSc in pharmaceutical pharmacy from the University of Sao Paulo in 2017. In 2018, she joined the PhD program at the Faculty of Pharmacy and Pharmaceutical Sciences at the University of Alberta under the supervision of Dr. Loben Lobenberg. Daniela has a clear understanding of the underlying sciences responsible for the complexity of oral drug absorption and has authored and co-authored publications in great scientific journals. So please allow me to introduce Dr. Lobenberg at this time. Good morning, everybody. Thank you for joining. And I think with that, we can start. Can everyone see my screen? We see, but now, yes. Perfect. Daniela, okay. please. Yeah, hi everyone. This is uh, Daniela. First of all, I'd like to, to thank you for, for the kind introduction and also uh, thank you Simulation Plus for, for this opportunity and for us to share our research and thank you all for attending this, this session. And without further ado, let's get into it. Uh, so today's presentation will be on the phytocannabinoids, dr drug drug interactions and their clinical implications. So um, to start off, I'd like to say that um, this presentation is based on our recently published paper at uh, Pharmacology and Therapeutics. So don't forget to check it out once, um, once you're done. Uh, here's the outline of what we're gonna be covering today. So first, uh, Dr. Lovenberg will give, a, will give us a, a, an introduction about the social political situation, uh, our cannabis situation. And then we'll move along with some uh, chemistry indications in the metabolic route of phytocannabinoids. And we will see um, how we compare the reported metabol or metabolism of phytocannabinoids in the literature. And then, um, yeah, the comparison with, with the predictions done with EDMAT predictor. And then we'll move along with uh, some drug-drug interactions involving such cannabinoids and uh, finally finish with some conclusions. Uh, Dr. Lovenberg, the floor is yours. Yeah, thank you very much. So, cannabis, fiber, food, medicine, narcotic, what is it? What should we know a little bit about cannabis? Um, from where, what are we talking? What, what, what is the plant and so on? What is the impact to society? This is what I want to give you a very brief um, introduction. Next slide, please. Um, so October 17, 2018, everybody thought the North America would look like this. <laughs> Over Canada, a big um, cloud of smoke and um, south of the border, nothing. But unfortunately, it didn't happen like that. Can you get to the next slide, please? So what happened with cannabis in Canada? Uh, cannabis is, was historically, I would say, for its regulations, be um, linked to opium. So opium was regulated in North America and the United States and also in Canada in the early 19th century, um, 1900s. So there were certain importation acts in, in Canada and in the United States. And in Canada, they had a narcotics drug act. And uh, in 1923, they thought, nah, let's put cannabis in the same box as um, the opioids. And since then, it was yeah, a strict, uh, restricted drug, and it took till 2018 till cannabis was legalized. Next slide, please. In the US, it was a little bit different. Cannabis was up to the um, 1930s a drug in, in the states, in the different states regulated as a drug. And then in 1972, under Nixon, um, they had a report on their desk to legalize my, um, cannabis. However, they decided differently. They put it on the schedule, in Schedule 1, and Schedule 1 is a schedule of drugs which seems to have no medical use and a high potential for abuse. 
Interestingly, it was then just 1976 when the first patient got a permit by the FDA to plant um, or to have a cannabis plant. Also very interesting is uh, that the government of the United States um, looked further into cannabis and there was in 1988 a very interesting uh, report came out um, and there one of the judges said in strict medical terms marijuana is far safer than many foods we commonly consume. For example, eating 10 raw potatoes can result in a toxic response. By comparison, it is physically impossible to eat enough marijuana to induce death. So that means, um, yeah, I personally think um, cannabis is probably very wrongly um, classified and we couldn't do the research for many, many years, which is needed to understand this plant. Next slide. Daniela, can you turn to the next slide? Yeah. I, uh, uh, perfect, yeah. And uh, Mariana today is one of the biggest, um, or, um, most trafficked illegal um, drugs. So they think 7 billion or even more might be the value which is trafficked uh, around the world. And it was especially in Canada where 50%, nearly 50% of the court cases were occupied by cannabis enforcement and of course then there's the question is this justified and in Canada at least the government says no and um, yeah, we will see how this development will continue all over the world because we saw after uh, Canada legalized it many many other countries all over the world also began with this. Next slide please. So what are we talking about? Cannabis is an interesting plant. It has a female plant and a male plant. And it is the female plant, which is the important part, uh, plant, because the female plant in their um, flowers, we have all these trichomes and in these trichomes, which are these white um, things to see on the leaves, this is where the cannabinoids are um, stored. And as you can see, the male plant um, has very, very few of these trichomes. Next slide, please. So there are three major, uh, so there are three species, the cannabis sativa, which has very thin leaves, which is up to five meters high, so quite high plant. Then the indica, which has leaves which are much broader. And what most people don't know, there's also um, cannabis rudealis, this is a very small plant which has also not very much cannabis content. And now the, here you see again the in the picture, yeah, never leave it, um, the trichomes and here is a picture of a plant and then you see all the white areas on the leaves. Um, this is the trichomes where the cannabinoids are stored. And with this I give it back to Daniela, please. Thank you very much. Uh, now we, we come to the chemistry, the phytocannabinoids chemistry and its indications. Um, so we, whenever we think about cannabis, the first thing that comes to mind is THC and CBD, which are indeed the two major chemical constituents of, uh, of cannabis. And interestingly enough, in, in the plant itself, they have a, um, uh, they come from CBG, CBGA, which is their uh, precursor in common. And then by their respective synthesis, you have CBDA or THCA, which through decarboxylation, then it generates CBD and THC. However, um, in the plant here, we see that we not only have CBD, um, CBD or T CBDA and THCA, but we can also have as a... Um, a third, the third most abundant biogenetic phytocannabinoids is CBCA. And interestingly, and, and likewise, it can also go through the decarboxylation process and generate CBC. Um, THC can also undergo oxidative de de degradation to generate CBN. And similarly to all the other acids, CBG, CBGA can also undergo decarboxylation and, and form CBG. Now, um, these cannabinoids, the, the terphenolic ones, um, 
they are not found in the fresh cannabis, meaning that um, in the plant we actually see this the carboxy form, so THCA or CBDA. And this, uh, as shown here, uh, the decarboxylation process actually occurs upon heating. And in the acid form, THCA and CBDA, they are not psychoactive. So that's why the plant or cannabis is usually consumed uh, is either smoked or consumed in baked goods because then whenever um, the heat is applied to that, THC and CBD are formed and THC will then uh, have its psychoactive effects. And as I've said, in the plant, we not only have the CBD or, or THC, um, but cannabis is actually a very uh, a plant really rich in content. It has more than 400 compounds, which, which means that, of course, it will have a wide range of pharmacological applications. But that also um, that also means that it will have can also have many interactions. Now, come to, coming to some some of the interact or the 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 applications or uh, indications that we have for some of the cannabinoids I studied so far. For CBD, we see that uh, the non psychoactive uh, cannabinoid. Uh, we have a pedolex, which is found in the market already, and it's usually uh, used for the treatment of epilepsy. And we have THC, which is psychoactive. Whenever it's metabolized, it forms uh, a very psychoactive metabolite. And but um, on the market, we do have uh, two uh, 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 medications today: Marino and Cesamat. Um, and they're usually used, or THC has been indicated for pain man management, antiemetic and spasmodic, uh, for uh, as an appetite stimulant. So that's why it's us usually used for anorexia, um, and has also been suggested for the uh, to be used in the glaucoma and asthma. Now um, there is also Sativax, which is uh, a whole plant extract which contains both CBD and THC. And it's usually used for neuro neuropathic pain for uh, MS and also pain, uh, very severe pain um, in, some cancer, in some cancer patients. And the other last studied uh, cannabinoids such as CBN and CBG, we, we see that CBN has been shown to have some sedative and it's bacterial um, applications or, or properties. And CBG can also have anti-inflammatory, antibiotic, and antifungal activities. And we also see that uh, CBD and THC, they have some propyl, uh, they have uh, their propyl homologs, um, they, which is CBDV and THCV, they've been, they've been, uh, it's been suggested their therapeutic potential for uh, reducing nausea. And um, and now we come to the metabolic route. So uh, of course, it's uh, the understanding of the individual SIP isoform specificity is actually very important for us uh, to keep in mind because then that will um, help us to predict enzyme inhibitions and potential drug drug interactions. And whenever we talk about metabolic route. Um, we, um, in, in a general sense, we're talking about phase one and two metabolism. So phase one, it would be basically that those reactions to increase the molecule's hydrophilicity, such as, and then the molecule would undergo oxidation, reduction, or hydrolysis. And then uh, phase two, it would involve conjugation reactions to either in, further increase the hydrophilicity of the compounds or even to inhibit its pharmacological activity. Now, for THCA, uh, what has been reported, uh, it's very similar to THC. Of course, they have a very similar structure. So the main component is the uh, hydroxylation at the carbon 11, generating the, the 11 hydroxy THCA. And uh, that will be further oxidized to its carboxy form. And, and all of these can be can undergo the hydro uh, the the conjugation with glucuronic acid, and and again THCA per se is what is found in the plant, and whenever whenever it is consumed as THCA, it, it is not converted to to THC in vivo. So again, just reiterating that we need the the heating process to generate THC. And it can also undergo many hydroxylation at, at its side chain. Um, 
and add the position, add the carbon eight to generate uh, uh, its hydroxylated form at the carbon eight. And among the many SIPs that were that were investigated, they saw that CYP 2C9 and CYP 3A4 were the major uh, major metabolizing enzymes for THC. And similarly, or sorry, for THCA. And similar similarly for THC, we also see that CYP 3A4 and CYP 2C9 are the major components. And um, for uh, and its metabolic pathway is very similar to THCA. So firstly, uh, uh, the major metabolite is uh, the hydroxylation at the 11th position. And this is the major metabolite in, encountered in the feces, which is 11-hydroxy-THCA. Um, and this is actually the, a very, very active, uh, psychoactive metabolite. And that metabolite is further, met uh, further uh, oxidized to its carboxyform, which is not really psychoactive. And then again, uh, many hydroxylations at the side chain and also at the carbon the uh, on the eighth position, and all of these can undergo glucuronic acid conjugation. And the carboxyform is the major metabolite found in urine. And now we come to CBD, which uh, was surprising to see that um, it can undergo. So CBD is um, again uh, similarly to THCA versus THC is the, the product of the spontaneous degradation of its biogenetic precursor, which is CBDA. And um, CBD actually undergoes a very extensive phase one metabolism, which results in a very low bioavailability across species in a very complex pharmacokinetic disposition pattern. As you can see here in this, uh, on, in this table, it can, many enzymes are involved, uh, have been reported to be involved in its metabolism, such as 1A1, CYP1A2, CYP2C19, 2D6, 3A4, 3A5, and 2A9 at, to a minor extent. And also phase two metabolism, not only glucuronic acid conjugation, but it can also go undergo uh, sulfonation. And both at the uh, uh, phenolic, oxygen as well as the hydroxylated metabolites. And the other the other phytocannabinoids which are not as much studied as it should uh, uh, as CBD and THC, we see that uh, they've been studied mainly in in, in animal models. And in this um, table here we can see the many metabolites that were generated. Of course that uh, it, it can get hydroxylated at the many positions on its side chains. And then uh, the numbers on the right-hand side of the table, it just shows the rank order of the in vitro CBC metabolites, both in mouse and rabbit. And here we see that the uh, um, uh, hydroxylation at the uh, very end of the side chain was the major metabolite found for CBC. And similarly for CBG, uh, it, it hasn't been as, as well characterized as THC and CBD. Uh, and various metabol in, in across species, the, the, the metabolite that was further, that was uh, mostly generated was the hydroxylated at the eighth position on its side chain. And now we come to and, and compare whatever we, we found in the literature with uh, predictions by EDMAT predictions, and here where uh, we came to uh, our collaboration with Simulations Plus in using EDMAT predictor to see um, how how now can we can can we would we actually be able to see whatever we found in the literature with then silico predictions and then comparable results. So the way we did it, uh, we we had the uh, structures, the chemical structures of the various phytocannabinoids uh, uh, that we wanted to analyze. And we either we either analyzed or we analyzed both if it was a CYP inhibitor or a CYP substrate. For, so for the CYP inhibitor, the five CYP isoforms were, were um, uh, investigated. So CYP 1A2, 2C9, 2C19, CYP 2D6, and 3A4. And also to analyze if they they would be CYP substrates for the nine uh, listed the nine CYP isoforms listed here, 
And if they were uh, if they were to be a SIP substrate, then we would run a met one cycle metabolite to see the metabolites and their percentage, their yield um, in or for the metabolites structure. And here we see that in silico predictions, they are actually very useful to suggest the role of each SIP isoform in, in phytocannabinoid metabolism. And with that understanding, that can actually be a guidance for the in vitro metabolism studies using the recombinant human, human enzymes. And now I will hand it over to Bob Clark. Thank you, Daniela. Um, and what's shown here are the predictions across the, the major SIP isoform, human SIP isoforms uh, for each of the, the major cannabinoids that were of interest. And EDMET predictor both predicts a categorical yes or no for whether a given compound is going to be a substrate for each SIP isoform, as well as a confidence estimate for that prediction. Now, SIP2C9 and 3A4 are the main SIPs involved in the metabolism of THC, and they're out their involvement was accurately, accurately predicted by ADMET predictor. The program also accurately predicted the likely contributions of SIPs 2C19, 2B6, and 2C8. Now, the complexities of CBD metabolism make predicting its metabolites particularly challenging. Of the many SIP isoforms that have been identified as being involved, the activity of SIPs 2C9, 2C19, and 2D6 were predicted accurately. CBD was erroneously predicted to not be a substrate for CYP3A4 or CYP1A2, however. Those are both false positives, but note the low confidence estimate for CYP3A4, only 43%. That makes it a soft error. In a prospective application, that marginal result would have prompted an experimental investigation. Next slide, please. Here we have uh, predictions about the um, role of the various cannabinoids as inhibitors of, this, of some of the SIP isoforms. Um, here we have two um, false, three false positives, again highlighted in red. Uh, the two that are circled are hard, hard errors. Um, uh, again, when you get complex metabolism, especially when you get epoxides formed, which form irreversible inhibitors rather comp than competitive inhibitors, which most of our models data, uh, most of the data used to build our models is based on, um, it gets much harder to get uh, precise um, predictions. Next slide, please. We also modeled for purposes of, of DDI prediction, um, the interactions with various transporters. None of the phytocannabinoids evaluated were predicted to be substrates for BCRP or inhibitors for OCT2. Um, using models for the uh, version of ADMET predictor that just got released. All of the cannabinoids other than THC were predicted to inhibit PGP. And for THC, its predictions were marginally negative, 52% uh, confidence. The acidic cannabinoids, THCA, CBCA, CBGA, and CBDA, were predicted to be substrates for PGP efflux, but they have a very high, um, a relatively high passive permeability. So it means that the, being a PGP substrate is unlikely to affect their intestinal absorption appreciably. They were also confidently predicted to be OATP1B1 and OATP1B3 inhibitors, whereas THC, CBC, CBG, and CBD yielded somewhat equivocal, equivocal predictions, i.e. they were positive or negative, but were less than 60% confidence. Next slide. Many metabolites have been reported in the literature for the main phytocannabinoids, and the software correctly predicted several of them. The estimated uncertainty for the SIP clearances, again, the, the uh, ADMET predictor provides uncertainties for um, the, the uh, oxidation rates for the various SIPs, just as it does 
confidences in the substrate, non-substrate, inhibitor, non-inhibitor classifications. Um, the estimated uncertainty for the SIP clearance predictions ranged from 2.8 fold for SIP 1A2 to 4.7 fold for SIP 3A4. This, taken together with the complexity of SIP kinetics and the potential for auto inhibition, makes the estimated metabolite yields for these compounds semi quantitative at best. In particular, the yields predicted for the major primary metabolites of THC and THCA, those that are hydroxylated at carbon 11, are not significantly different from those predicted for the other major metabolites. The same holds true with regard to the tertiary oxidation products. THC-COOH, i.e. the main THC metabolite found in human urine, and THCA-COOH. By tertiary oxidation products, I mean the, the um, metabolite of the metabolite of the metabolite. Note, however, that only metabolites and labile glucuronides that get excreted into the bile will appear in the feces, just as urinary metabolites are restricted to those that are eliminated through the kidneys. Hence, the distribution, that is, the percentage produced uh, of the metabolites in the excreta are not expected to directly reflect the distribution of primary oxidation products formed in the liver, which is what the models and the admit predictor, models and admit predictor estimate. Daniela, back to you. Thank you very much. Uh, and now we come to the potential based on uh, these. Um, uh, the literature findings, the drug-drug interactions involving the cannabinoids. And um, we, need, we need to keep in mind that uh, important pharmacokinetics drug interactions, they are SIP-based. And they usually occur whenever a compound inhibits, induces, or competes for the, a SIP isoform that metabolites the other, the other drug that is taken, being taken with it. So for example, here we see uh, cannabinoids, they could either induce, inhibit, or be a substrate for a, um, in a specific SIP isophore, and whatever drug is being taken with it can have its pharmacokinetic uh, impacted by, by phytocannabinoids. Um, you are generating uh, um, different, different absorption and pharmacokinetic patterns. When, when we come here and we see based on, based on our in silico results for, for SIP inhibition, we use the prototypic typical substrates for the different SIPs that we uh, uh, modeled of, or um, try to see which phytocannabinoid would actually inhibit it. So based on that, we see that uh, acetaminophen, aloperidol, warfarin, they are usually, they are, um, uh, substrates for SIP 1A2. And based on our uh, in silico results, that would, uh, that would be inhibited by THCA, that specific SIP isoform. Hence, we would have a probable consequence of increased drug plasma concentration. And for that, we would have to recommend then, well, a dose adjustment has to be done and to reduce. So you can safely take both of these compounds together. So that's how how you can um, uh, use even in silico predictions or, or base, um, uh, make clinical um, recommendation based on such in silico results. And the same, the same thought, uh, the same thought applies to the other SIPs, and uh, which were uh, predicted to be inhibited by different phytocannabinoids. And, and here we have the different uh, prototypical substrates and um, the probable consequence, which is usually if it if it is inhibited, of course, then you would have an increased drug concentration, drug plasma concentration of the drug that has been administered with it, and then you would have to do a dose adjustment based on that. So now we come to THC, and it's it's uh, what's been reported for uh, both pharmacodynamic interactions and pharmacokinetic interactions. And we see with many many drugs, it's been it's been reported that it can ha have, for example, with uh, tricyclic antidepressants, it can have um, additive uh, additive tachycardia, hypertension, drowsiness. And then based on that, you would have to do a dose adjustment. So all of these listed here um, at the top part of the, of the table, 
their pharmacodynamic interactions. Um, and you, uh, yeah, the main recommendation would be uh, adjusting the dose or av avoid smoking whenever uh, the the um, the interactions be being seen after smoking marijuana. And and for the pharmacokinetic interactions, then of course we come to SIP, uh, to the specific SIP um, uh, interactions that we would have. So with, um, for example, phenytoin, which is metabolized by CYP2C9, and THC, what, what happened is that whenever uh, it, was been, uh, it was taken with THC, we saw that uh, phenytoin uh, plasma levels, or sorry, in vitro metabolism of phenytoin was uh, increased whenever THC was present. So you would, and it is a, um, a, a very narrow window therapeutic index drug, so you would have to do a therapeutic drug monitoring in this case. Um, and and here's also a list of different drugs and different pharmacokinetic interactions. And now we come to CBD. So CBD is both a substrate and an inhibitor of CYP enzymes. So here on the left-hand side, we see CBD and xenobiotics. And we have to keep in mind that this is a two-way street. Not only does CBD affect the, the pharmacokinetics and uh, the metabolism of other xenobiotics, but the other way around is also true. So whenever you're taking medicinal cannabis, you have to keep, keep in mind that other drugs can affect then the pharmacokinetics of um, the cannabinoids that you're taking. So firstly, looking at the CBD effect on other xenobiotic effect or pharmacokinetics, we see that uh, a case report on a hexobarbital uh, involved an increased bioavailability and half-life uh, elimination half-life whenever they were taken together. Clobazam had its uh, plasma level increased by 60% and its, uh, in its active metabolite actually had uh, its plasma level increased by 500% whenever taken up with CBD. At a, um, so in this case, CBD was taking at five milligram per kg per day, and then they tried to eat it up until 25 milligram per kg per day was um, was achieved. So in that dose regimen, we saw that um, uh, very sharp increased plasma level or clobazam and its active metabolite. And in this case, what the SIPs involved were uh, CYP3, 4, and CYP219. And the recommendation would have been to reduce clobazam dose. And so then you can reduce consecration side effects and then you can safely use both drugs together. And the same thing with warfarin. Uh, a patient had its uh, INR values very stable for many, many years. And whenever warfarin, whenever the patient started taking CBD with it, they saw that there was an increased value, uh, INR values. And uh, so they had to readjust the warfarin dose. And then whenever that was done, they were able, the patient was able to take uh, both, both of uh, the compounds safely together. And the, and the primary SIPs involved were 2C9 and 3A4. Now, one thing that we have to keep in mind that CBD is actually a very potent inhibitor for CYP3, 4, and CYP2D6 which is a very uh, big red light for us because CYP3A4 metabolizes a wide range of, um, of drugs. So macrolides, calcium channel blockers, benzodiazepines, antihistamines, so some statins. And uh, because of that, we have to keep in mind that CBD can really affect the pharmacokinetics of many, many xenobiotics because of its inhibitory um, effect on CYP3A4, and as well as CYP2D6, which is a very important CYP that um, metabolizes CYP2, uh, antidepressants and psychotics, beta blockers, opioids. Uh, so we have to keep that in mind. And now looking um, the other way around on xenobiotics affecting CBD's pharmacokinetics, whenever CBD was taken with rifampicin, which is a SIP inducer, we saw that, that that actually decreased the peak plasma concentration of CBD. And whenever it was taken with ketoconazole, which is a SIP inhibitor, it increases almost by, it increased almost by, it, it almost doubled the peak plasma concentration of CBD.
Now, um, drug-drug interactions, they are not only about uh, metabolizing enzymes. Whenever we're talking about pharmacokinetics, then um, yes, we're talking about SIP uh, specificities. But we also have to keep in mind that what about pharmacodynamic interactions like we saw with um, THC? Uh, it could cause tachycardia or uh, things like that. Um, what about protein binding? That could also cause displacement and then increase or decrease uh, the, the blood plasma concentration based on the protein binding and displacement effects. And also gastric motility. It's been shown that THC can actually decrease the gastric motility and that actually can up, um, uh, influence the absorption pattern of certain drugs. So for example, if uh, someone is taking a uh, basic drug that would actually benefit from being in the stomach for a little longer so it can dissolve better, so then move along to the intestines, make a, a supersaturated solution, maybe uh, increase its absorption. So with the decreased motility, gastric motility, and spending more time in the, in, in, um, the stomach, that could actually be beneficial or the other way around. Uh, and we can also have a matter of transporters. And in transporters, we actually saw a very interesting, in, interesting case, which is um, fatty acid binding protein, FABP, which has been actually recently found. I think it was published um, uh, this year, an article about it, which is, uh, it, it was deemed as a previously unrecognized site of DDI for, for phytocannabinoids because if you think about it, um, phytocannabinoids, they are really lipophilic, so very, very lipophilic molecules. So they would have not, not a problem in crossing the membrane. However, whenever they come to the cytosol, then they are in a very, in an aqueous medium. So they need now a transporter to, to kind of do the cytosolic trafficking so they can actually reach the site of absor or the site of metabolism because um, the metabolizing enzymes they're they're uh, located in the in the in endoplasmic reticulum within the cell or in the hepatocytes. So for for these to be um, metabolized the metabolized they actually have to reach that site of metabolism. And not on, that's not only true for phytocannabinoids but for many many other drugs. Uh, they, they've been, it's very well characterized that they need such a transport to reach its um, metabolizing site. Now we see that um, THC or phytocannabinoids can actually compete. They can uh, with, other, with other drugs that, that also depend on such a transport to be metabolized. So in this case, they would not necessarily compete for the SIP itself, but again, to actually reach the, 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 the site of metabolism. And um, that can lead to unpredictable pharmacological re responses due to the, uh, uh, this competing mechanism. And we have to keep in mind that, um, yes, there are very uh, concerning inhibitory effects and uh, uh, interactions that we, we, we've seen and we have shown here, but we also have to keep in mind that uh, that occurs at a certain concentration. So, for example, dextromethorphan is metabolized to dextrophin by CYP2D6, and CBD has been known to, to inhibit such a CYP. But its inhibitory constant is around 2.5 micromolar. And the plasma concentration of CBD after four vocal sprays of Sativax was around 9.6 nanomolars, whereas the CBD concentration after um, smoking a cannabis cigarette, uh, which was spiked with 20 milligrams of CBD, was around 3.63 micromolar. So here we see that um, even though CBD does um, inhibit such uh, a CYP enzyme, it's plasma levels were not high enough to, would be not enough, uh, high enough to actually uh, have a clinical uh, um, observation. So low, low oral doses
Daniela, I think you may have cut out. Oh, sorry. There um, we go. Oh, thank you. Okay, okay. Uh, what, what was the last thing? Uh, just the conclusion part? Yes. Okay, thank you. So yeah, so just as a, a, a conclusion here, we see that understanding phytocannabinoids metabolism is a factor, is a key factor in the drug development process. So we can reduce uh, the risk of costly late stage project failure due to such adverse adverse admet properties. And with increased uh, widespread and you, uh, uh, use of legal marijuana and med medically and recre recreationally, the DDI knowledge of essential uh, is of essential practical importance to avoid such clinical complications. And we see that computer modelings of metabolic pathways, they are a powerful tool to predict, uh, predict such DDIs. However, we do need more investigational efforts in this field so we can have better, better models and this should motivate more studies along this line in the near future. So with that, I'd like to thank you all, and uh, now we can come go to the Q&A section. Great, thank you, Daniela. That was a great presentation. So for the audience, are you a current user of Admit Predictor software? We'll give you a few seconds to answer here before we begin the Q&A. If you haven't already written your question into the questions panel and submitted it, please do so now. We have a, a, about 10 minutes, uh, 15 minutes for questions for Daniela or Bob or Neymar. All right, here we go. Thank you for sharing your answers with us. Okay, so let's look at the questions that have come in. The first one, um, and Daniela, you can start was what was the biggest surprise in your findings? Right, um, that's that's a good question, thank you. Um, yeah, the biggest surprise for us was to see how, because whenever we look into phytocannabinoids, everybody just talks badly about THC uh, because it's psychoactive and so on and so forth. But we saw actually that with CBD, which is not uh, really psychoactive, it had way more interactions and, and inhibitory potential than THC. So we kind of see like a, the flip side of the coin. Uh, it was a very interesting to see that um, uh, CBD was, yeah, in, in a sense, a bit more harmful in, in, the, in the sense of uh, interactions with uh, SIP isoforms. Okay, great question. And quickly, while uh, more questions are coming in, uh, Cheryl Ann, I believe uh, this is a good point for us to introduce Bob. So go ahead. Thank you, Arlene. Um, Bob Clark, uh, a Simulations Plus Treasure. Uh, Bob got his bachelor's and master's degree from Ohio University. His PhD in biochemistry, molecular and cell biology is from Cornell University. Postdoctoral work on plant bioenergetics at Brookhaven National Lab served as a bridge to his many subsequent years of industrial experience, including long stints at Monsanto Agricultural Company and Tripos. Bob joined Simulations Plus as a director of life sciences at the beginning of 2010 and became a senior research fellow in November 2017. A full list of his nearly 40 years of publications can be found on Google Scholar, uh, and we are most appreciative of his time and efforts today. Having said that, back to you, Arlene. Thank you, Cheryl Ann. And Bob, this question is for you. Uh, what other capabilities could Admit Predictor provide? Uh, that's a really long list. Um, it has uh, about 145 uh, Admet properties that it predicts. Uh, actually, more than that now. I think it's about 160 now with the APX version that just got released. Um, including physical chemical properties like solubility. Um, it has probably the world's best pKa estimator, uh, especially if you are looking at compounds that have more than one ionizable center. 
um, uh, and it predicts lipophilicity, um, uh, solubility in bioRelevant media. Uh, it has a, a module for toxicology, um, mo the module for um, metabolism includes the major SIP isoforms that we showed you today, the inhibit inhibition and um, substrate models. It also has predictions for KM, VMAX, and clearance, not just overall, but for each individual metabolite. Um, so it's a pretty enormous list. I suggest you go to the website um, or contact us for more detailed information. Uh, the most recent uh, addition to the, the family of models is what we call AIDD, which is a, a generative drug design module. Great, thank you. Okay, Daniela, this is for you. Can you talk a little bit more about the pharmacodynamic interaction risks and the type of clinical evidence available? Sure. Um, can you hear me okay? Yes. Hello? Okay, thank you. Um, yeah, the pharmacodynamic effects, so there, there aren't um, many, uh, many reports on the literature on it, but they're mainly talking about, so something that, um, so if THC, so it's uh, having an uh, uh, effect on, on your um, central nervous system, something that uh, either uh, something that depresses your nervous system or excites it, so that could 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 have an additive effect on on its um, effect. So whenever we're talking about the pharmacodynamic interactions, we're just um, talking about like it's how how cannabinoids can actually potentialize or, or decrease the effect that other drugs would would uh, would have. So if it's uh, you're taking an antidepressant and then THC would actually excite your central nervous system, so then you have opposite um, opposite uh, uh, mechanisms of action, and then you would have a dynamic interaction in the sense of uh, effect, not so much metabolism. Okay, great. Um, Bob, let's start with you. Um, and maybe you can uh, answer this. Are, are there any thoughts about modeling CBD in Gastro Plus? I don't know any reason we couldn't. Um, we haven't at, at, at Simulations Plus itself. Um, in terms of oral, it would be straightforward. Um, I don't know for for smoke, what you would get from smoking, it would be complicated because it's actually formed, as I understand it from the excellent webinar, it's actually formed as you smoke it, which would, would complicate the simulation. But for the for oral, uh, it should be pretty straightforward. We haven't done it, as far as I know. Well, good question. Thank you. We'll uh, go to the Gastro Plus team. Uh, Daniela, for you, does the 3A4-5 metabolism happen mainly in the gut? No, well, there there actually is some metabolism in the gut, but primarily it is done, it it's in 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 the liver. There there are though, like it's not completely ruled out, but the main the main. Uh, uh, site of metabolism is in the liver. So first pass metabolism is, is huge. Uh, so if there would be, let's say, a way for it to circumvent first pass metabolism, you would see an increased bioavailability of cannabinoids. Um, however, you wouldn't, uh, you would still see a little bit of it in the gut, but the main source is, is the liver. Okay. And keeping with that theme, are there any pharmacogenetic effects given the many uh, me metabolic pathways? Bob and Daniela, you can both uh, chime in on this one. Um, I guess. Daniela, go ahead and start. <laughs> sure. Okay. <laughs> Thanks. Um, well, 
yeah, if you see, I guess I guess it would be a case by case scenario in the sense of um, if you do have a uh, polymorphism of a, a, a specific SIP that let's say metabolizes your your phytocannabinoids, then um, yeah, you would see an uh, um, you would see something there, but I, I don't I, I haven't come across yet um, studies on 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 SIP poly, polymorphism or, or, or genetics or pharmacogenetic effects on on in that sense with um, phytocannabinoids. And I I don't have anything to add to that. Sorry. Okay. Okay. What about the interaction between CBD and midazolam? Um, a CYP3A4 substrate. Uh, according to the NDA, uh, CBD has no interaction with midazolam. What could be the reason? Yeah, that would have that would probably be because of uh, its plasma level concentrations. So at the plasma level concentrations that CBD is medically used, then uh, then yeah, we, we wouldn't be able to see that in vivo. However, in vitro, it's been characterized, uh, like CBD has been characterized to inhibit CYP3, A4, CYP2D6, and so on. Uh, but like I said, we always have to keep in mind the concentrations and the dose that these uh, cannabinoids are used in, um, in the uh, therapeutics. Okay. And to follow up on that question, did you consider IC50 or IC50 unbound to predict drug interaction? Do you want to take that one, Bob? Uh, that uh, that the the IC fifty or actually the KI is what you would want to use. Um, mm -hmm. Unfortunately for SIPs, um, their KI is very dependent on the on the substrate that you're talking about being inhibited. Because they're especially for CYP three A four, um, and so we don't have, uh, and so you see a different KI and a different IC fifty if you assay different substrates. Um, so we don't have particular model. We'd have to have a separate model for each substrate we wanted to do, um, uh, and so it's it's just not practical to do that. Um, in, in silico for for step three a, for the steps in general, but for three a four in particular, um, okay. it, so so there isn't a fixed cutoff in the inhibitor not inhibitor uh, models. Sorry. All right. Now, have you considered um, Daniela extending the research to include pharmacokinetics in discrete populations? Um. No, but that would that that's actually a good a good idea, um, but I still haven't uh, gone that far yet, <clears throat> step by step. <laughs> okay, great. Well, we look forward to seeing more from you and uh, the University of Alberta at the Faculty of Pharmacy and Pharmaceutical Sciences. We're always happy to continue to help. All right, let's see one of uh, our last questions before we end for today is, are these predictions validated in any way? Is there any docking used considering the water molecule, water molecules or dynamic undocking? Uh, do you want me to, you mean the, it depends on whether you mean the predictions in particular for the cannabinoids or if you mean the, so predictions I, in general. I think the they'd like to know the strategies for ranking which the SIPs are, you know, which ones are more important than the others in a particular metabolic process. Well, we do not use docking to try to do this. Um, docking is, you know, if you read the literature, you'll find docking almost never works very well for SIPs. There's a there's a famous Docking paper by a competitor I'm not going to name, where if you check, you'll find that they very have a great model that shows that they produce the wrong stereoisomer of the product. Um, 
uh, it just it doesn't work because the the binding sites are too flexible. Because that's their job. Their job is to be promiscuous, um, and it just really doesn't work. I, it's it's one of the reasons that we focus on admet properties is because those typically, uh, because of the promiscuity of the enzymes involved, are are better modeled with with basically 2D descriptors. Docking just really doesn't work very well for them in general. Uh, any final thoughts, Daniela? I guess um, just to uh, like, I'd just like to thank everyone for attending and uh, again for the opportunity and collaboration with Simulation Plus. It's been a great work. Great. Well, a final question for our audience. Um, would you like to know more information about our reference site program? We are always looking uh, for collaborations. We know the science cannot be done by everyone in our circle, and we're always looking to expand. So we'll give you a few seconds here to answer, and then we can follow up with more information about the reference site program. Okay, great. And as Bob mentioned, you can find uh, this information, um, this publication specifically in our resource center. The webinar re replay will be online. So thank you, Daniela, Dr. Lobenberg, and Dr. Clark. You have educated us on how important DDI knowledge and metabolism data is critical to avoid possible clinical complications. And you've shown us that admit predictor software is a powerful tool to predict those DDIs, which as Daniela, you said is a key factor within the drug development process. To evaluate admit predictors technology for your latest research project, or to learn more about our reference site program, please visit our website at www.simulations-plus.com. And just like that, our hour and webinar is up in smoke. We look forward to seeing you at our next online event. Thank you.